Okay, I guess we better get started. Time flies. <laughs> Welcome to this panel discussion with Christina, Brindis, and Margaret. Um, my name is Maxine Hanks, and I'm moderating this session. I'm thrilled to be here. This was a dynamite morning. Um, first of all, what I want to do is to give Christina and Margaret and Brendis a chance to, especially for those of you who were not here earlier, um, let them each give a, a quick one minute, 30 second to one minute summary of what they talked about. And then um, I want to give each one of them a chance to respond to each other, to each other's comments, perhaps make a comment or ask a question of each other. And then I'm going to share a couple of quick comments about each one of their presentations, and then we're going to turn it over to you for questions and discussion. So I want to start with Christina Rossetti. Would you um, go ahead and give us a quick summary of what you presented? Yeah, so my work is really centered on um, giving voice to and validating expressions of Mormonism and groups of Mormons that are not within the LDS church and are not traditionally represented in Mormon studies, and that includes women who, rather than go through institutional channels for religious authority in the priesthood, are just claiming it on their own, and that includes doing immersion ceremonies and giving blessings and praying to Heavenly Mother and just kind of take claiming what they think they already have. Great. Okay, Margaret Toscano. So I tried to do two main things in my paper. The most important was the notion of the idea that we need to embody God, that embodiment is a validation of the physical world, and also that love is relational and needs to be performed and enacted, therefore God needs a presence in the world. And the second thing I tried to do, which is a bigger project, is I'm trying to take ancient ideas about the mother God that you find in many different cultures and show how we can see it in our own Mormon theology and Mormon scriptures. And I focused on Mary in the Book of Mormon as a very crucial figure for embodying the love of God. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, Brendis. And what I tried to do is to basically let us all remember that each one of us has the power of God within us, that each one of us is beloved by God, and that we really don't need anyone to tell us that we have that power in order to use it. Beautiful. Three extremely powerful presentations. If you did not get a chance to hear them all this morning, you must listen to the recording. Um, okay, I'd like to give each of you a chance now to respond to each other's comments. And um, we could, you can decide who wants to go first or go down the line, but any comments that you have for each other, but also questions that you might have for each other. I go first. I'll go first. Um, and I guess I want to start with Christina. Um, I am just fascinated and so thrilled that you are giving voice to women who either have stepped outside the faith to, to find their place or who have had to leave the church. And so what prompted you to do that? Uh, so the, for those who don't know um, me, other than I'm a grad student, but I also work at an organization called Sunstone, <laughs> um, which has probably a diverse range of opinions. Um, but so Sunstone believes that there's more than one way to Mormon, and we've affirmed that ex-Mormonism and former Mormonism and post-Mormonism is a valid expression of Mormonism, and it is, a, it is a valid Mormon identity. And so that was something that was really powerful to me, was kind of looking at these women who very much still claim to be Mormon. They still say that they're Mormon, um, but they don't go to church. And so I was like, what does that mean <laughs> to be Mormon but not go to church and not go to the temple and not even not believe in Joseph Smith and not believe that anyone's a prophet? Um, but they still claim it. And so part of that is that they claim that they're beloved children of heavenly parents and that matters and that they have power to do things because of their Mormon ancestors. Um, and to my knowledge, there's very little research on the ex-Mormon experience um, and kind of looking at Emma as an example of what it means to leave the church and still be a powerful voice of Mormonism. Right, and Margaret, I just, I have always struggled, I guess, with the idea of God having a body because for me, it felt like whoever was describing that body 
was going to describe it in a way that left me out. But I was fascinated by your images, mm -hmm. particularly the one, you know, that you focused on that it was female, but no, no clear ethnicity, no clear. And so I just wanted you to talk a little bit about that concern of, of embodying God, of if that works in any way to be exclusionary. Embodying God has been exclusionary. <laughs> it is a big problem. There's no question about that. So I see this as a conundrum. If you don't embody God, how do you relate on a really personal level? But if you embody God, then it has to be specific in some way. Although that picture I had was a good example of how at least in terms of kind of a racial identity, that beautiful uh, artist, you know, she has all these pictures of Mother God. She does it all the time. But I also want to add that the truth of it is, is that if you look historically, people have represented God, even the Christian God, in their own image. So I also had that other picture of a black Madonna. And in fact, I had three black Madonnas one that was from um, the Orthodox Church and a very early icon with the dark skin. The other was a medieval black Madonna from Southern Europe and then a contemporary black woman. And you see the same thing with pictures of Jesus. Um, and so I think that it is trying to make the relationship your own. And in fact, I see this as a theme among the three of our papers. The idea that, that you have to claim the spirituality, you have to claim the relationship. And so I ended my talk by saying, we need more pictures of God. And I'm, I think we could have, and, and I think it's interesting in Mormonism when you have this notion of Elohim as a council of gods, we could have a, a council of gods of all races. Now, wouldn't that be a nice thing to put in the temple film? <laughs> I always try for the radical. <laughs> You're next. Oh, I'm next. Um, gosh, my mind went blank after that. Um, so maybe I can ask both of you again this one of the things that I noticed at connecting our talks also was the idea of women claiming their spiritual power. And my experience is that women are very good at doing that. Um, and that mostly women are not afraid to do that. They're afraid to talk about it publicly. And that's the difference I see. I've been collecting um, uh, heavenly mother visions from women and some men for like 30, 40 years. And these things happen. So maybe the question I would like the t to ask the two of you is, do you think it's important that we have public expressions of this private claiming of power? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's really important. It's, it's a Mormon experience to have visions of God. It's a Mormon experience to have ecstatic um, encounters with the divine. So this isn't outside of a Mormon purview at all. Um, and it has never been outside of a Mormon purview to talk about those experiences. Um, even experiences of the temple has historically been something people did. And so I, think, I don't think equity and representation can happen until people talk about their experiences with their heavenly mother like they talk about their experiences with their heavenly father. And, of course, yes is my answer, too. And coming at it from the standpoint of a convert and a black convert at that, I mean, if you go to homes of black people, we will have black baby Jesus, and we will have. Mm -hmm. And so it, it would be wonderful if the art in our churches and our temples reflected the diversity of our church. We, if we truly are a worldwide church, then you know, all of the pictures of Jesus should not look the same. In fact, my daughter who came, went with me to my meeting with my bishop, one of the 
many things she had to say about that meeting was that, yeah, and we were sitting in that room with the whitest Jesus I've ever seen. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So my question, a lot of these kind of go back to women's authority and women's power, and in the LDS context, that usually manifests in ordination. Um, And so given, you know, so I'm not Mormon for the, for context. I'm Roman Catholic and we've been fighting for women's ordination for a very long time to the tune of 2000 years. So, um, I get that struggle deeply, but, um, I remember when Kate Kelly, um, was excommunicated and I remember before she was excommunicated, she made a really powerful statement. She said, LDS women feel equal, but equality is not a feeling. And that's true. Equality is not a feeling. It's something that can be measured. And so based on representations of um, Heavenly Mother and ordination, do you agree with that? And what measures of equality do you think would be good steps? Do you think are important? Do you think we need measures of equality? I agree that it's not simply a feeling, but obviously it involves feelings, right? But it has to, again, this is embodiment, right? It needs to be manifest in the community. And I think that that's extremely important. So I have been working for women's ordination since 1984. Um, and I really do feel that that's a crucial way that you know, without women's ordination that we cannot really have that sort of equality. Um, and I wanna say in connection with this, as someone who was excommunicated for writing about um, both women in priesthood and also the mother God, um, I had personal experiences of knowing that when I was in the temple that I had been endowed with the priesthood. And as I look at the theology, which I will not bore you with, right, uh, I, I really believe that the endowment bestows priesthood and it's a personal thing, it's not institutional. And I still claim that priesthood, the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood. I very much agree that equality is not a feeling. And one of the things I think that has sort of compelled me or kept me going in this fight is growing up as a black woman in the South, um, I experienced a good deal of discrimination um, in the world outside the faith world. And I absolutely refuse to be treated as a second class citizen in in God's house. And and so that is why I will probably continue to stand up and jump up and 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 demand and and you know do all of the things that I do. Um, are there measures? I mean, I certainly took some degree of pleasure, I guess that would be the word in the changes in the temple language, although I haven't been able to go in and see it myself, but because it to me it felt like that was a tangible step uh, recognizing how many women had written so many letters and had done so many things about their feelings about how the temple made them feel. So I, I saw that as a tangible step. There have been other small steps that have been made. The fact that we can even talk about ordaining women, the fact that we we, we are able to have a very open conversation about Heavenly Mother. All of those things are steps. Does more need to be done? Yes. Am I very impatient? Yes. So, um, I, but, you know, our church moves at a snail's pace in many things. Um, we, we saw how long it took our church to catch up with um, the 1978 revelation, and even then we, we fully not implemented that. So yes, there need to be measures, and we each one of us in our individually needs to be working every day to make that happen. Any other questions that you each have for each other at this point, or pretty much covered? I thought I'd share just a couple of reflections about each one of their presentations and ask each one of them a personal question before we then turn it over to you all for questions. First, starting with Brenda's, um, it's incredibly power the way that Brenda's um, claims her own identity and narrative and place as a woman of color. 
in Mormon tradition, culture, and, act and feminism and activism, and that she recognizes the polygamy and the priesthood ban are man-made um, doctrines and policies. So she claims her spiritual power via her direct relationship with God and that the power of God and Christ are not just man's. They, man can't give those things to us. They are ours through our own direct, unmediated relationship with God. So as she put it, the task is to claim our own inner spiritual power and direct connection to God and to use it and to have others recognize that, our brethren and our leaders. These are crucial points in feminist theology and the recovery of um, women's spirituality and women's authority. This is central. And this, this is a, a theory and a practice very near and dear to my own heart and my own work on recovering women's authority and, and personal spiritual um, power and practice. Um, so Brenda, I just want to ask you a question. A per, I'm, I'm getting, I'm asking a personal question of each one of them to kind of go deeper personally. Brenda, how do you feel about the maybe the place uh, of women uh, in, of color in our liberal Mormon subcultures and meetings and this conference? I mean, I think I'm not sure. I think you're the only woman of color here. Maybe or no, no, there are a couple of them. Yeah. Not very many. And so would you comment on, on, on that? For too much of my life, I have been the only one in places or one of an, maybe only two or three in places. It's 2019, folks. <laughs> that should not still be happening. I know that there are women of color who are attending this institution. I don't know what could have been done to get more of them here. Um, I know one of the things that is used in other institutions with which I have a connection is you give them class credit <laughs> or you know, or tie it to class credit and, and that's one way to get people here. Um, I probably could have done a better job of publicizing in my own Facebook group, but you know, life happened. But I would have expected there to be a little bit more publicizing. I mean, it's, it's 2019. We, I should not be looking out on a group and having to search and say, you know, I should not have to walk into a room and look to see if there's one, maybe two, maybe three black people so that I then go, black people! <laughs> <laughs> you know, yesterday, a young black man came in and I was tempted to do that to him, but I thought he's young, he might think this old lady is crazy, so I, w I, would, not, I would not do that to them. But, but it really shouldn't be happening in 2019. And I'm gonna venture to say that it really shouldn't be my responsibility or any other persons of color responsibility to make it not happen. I mean, y'all all claim to be progressive Mormons. Y'all need to do better. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Brenda. We needed that, and that's why I asked the question. Christina, next. Um, I really appreciated the f a couple of things. The fact that you're recognizing and including the place of fundamentalist women within Mormon history and culture, our culture today, as, as a as actually an integral part that sometimes becomes like a shadow that we that we don't fully recognize, um, and the fundamentalist women's practices as well, as well as Mormon feminist practices that both fundamentalist women and and uh, Mormon women, both inactive and active, are recovering and reclaiming historical practices of Mormon women to bless, to heal, to use herbs, uh, to recognize the symbols of the feminine in the temple and the mother. And, um, and again, that's wonderful. I particularly like the way that you mentioned that there are two ways Mormon women claim their power in Mormonism, or you mentioned two ways, not that there are only two, but you mentioned two crucial ways outside of the church, outside of the institution, they're reclaiming it through charisma and spirituality, but also inside, they're rec reclaiming it institutionally. Um, and I especially appreciated that you keyed on Emma Smith as an important symbol of women's authority. 
because of her claiming of her own authority and refusal to go with Brigham West. Um, I like the way you talk about how women continue to invoke authority from the past in the present. So, um, Christina, I just wanted to ask you, how has your study of these things that you outlined today, ha how has that affected you personally in your own personal spirituality and your, your own um, f feminist, theological, or religious, historical um, relationships? Affect is not my thing, but here we go. Uh, I'm gonna tell, I have a story about that, I guess. Um, so I work at Sunstone, and so we have a lot of Mormons come, and I work with fundamentalist Mormons, so I'm very keenly attuned to what it means to look at someone and say I work with a community that they believe to be apostate. So I know what that feels like, but I've never actually felt what it feels like to be an Orthodox person who has to wrestle with that. Until this year at Sunstone, and I've told this story several times, uh, my friend, Lindsay Hanson Park, brought a priest to Sunstone, and she was so excited, and he was going to give an opening prayer, and it was great, and um, she introduced me to him, and she's like, Christina, here's a priest, and I looked at his collar, and I looked at her nervously, and then he walked away after we met, and I looked at her, and I said, he's not a real priest, <laughs> and, she, and she looked at me so confused, and she was like, what do you mean he's not a, what, and I was like, his authority's not real. And I had, to, I had to actually sit in that for a minute and say, oh, I spend my whole life working with apostates, <laughs> but it's easy to like apostates when they're not yours. Mm -hmm. And that was a really hard lesson to learn. And so I had to learn um, how to love my own apostates. And so I started um, working with um, Catholic, uh, the, you know, Julie Byrne wrote a really great book called The Other Catholics, and I started kind of really thinking about what it means to be one of the other Catholics that my church thinks are wrong. And so working with Mormons that are not um, part of the LDS church and are considered to have incorrect authority has made me have to really sit in the reality of my own faith, which is a very dominant Christian religion um, and has exerted control over people for a long time and really have to think about um, my own preconceived ideas about what it means to be Catholic through the lens of having to sit in the reality of what it means to be Mormon. Thank you, that's profound. We're happy that we've had a convert <laughs> to help you appreciate the, the apostates within your own tradition. Um, I especially identify with the apostate Catholics because I was kind of an independent old Catholic for about 10 or 12 years myself uh, as a Gnostic Christian. Uh, and Margaret, um, uh, it was really good to hear Margaret talk about the mother uh, and the embodied mother. This is something she's talked about a lot over the years and something she in particular has articulated the importance of the embodied divine feminine and why we need to, to not um, ignore or dismiss that. Um, I also appreciated the way that she talked about the mother is a symbol of relationship, fullness, and social justice, the embodied mother. And the way that Joseph Smith put the physical on equal footing with the spiritual as necessary for a fullness of joy, marrying the physical and the spiritual. This is something that Margaret has talked about a lot for the last 30 years. Um, and also the notion of the God of gender versus the God beyond gender or beyond humanness. Does that solve problems or does it introduce new problems? Um, and she discussed that beautifully. Um, and the notion that the mother, we need a mother as someone who understands us as female human beings in a physical body, um, who understands our suffering as women in a, in a body, a physical body. This is something Margaret and I have both talked about. In fact, I have to just pause here and say, Margaret and I have been talking about the mother and these issues for a long time, <laughs> since the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, in fact, there's, a, there's a, an entertaining audio tape out on the internet from 1991, it's a Sunstone tape, where I was advocating a need for feminist theology and we need our mother. And then we had a reflection panel of three women, Margaret and me and Janice and uh, six men. And it was fascinating because Margaret and Janice and I are saying, we need her and this is important. And the men were kind of dismissing us and saying, well, that's kind of <laughs> silly and, <laughs> and why? You know, this is back in 1991. And then Eugene England, who was on the panel, comes in at the end and says, he makes peace with all of us and says, 
this makes a lot of sense, and I think we really need to listen and, and try to understand. So he was the peacemaker on the panel. Uh, of course, as Margaret mentioned, all of her work since the early 80s and, and my own resulted in both of us being excommunicated for it, uh, which was not easy and yet was, I think, a, a spiritual calling. Um, and I, I particularly appreciate what Margaret said about that we have a tendency in Mormon tradition and, and culture, especially in the church, to preempt the mother before she's had a chance to become fully expressed within our own tradition. That was such a powerful statement. So I want to ask Margaret um, a question I asked her back in 1988. I want to revisit that question. Um, how do you feel about the mother personally now? Can you share that with us? Christina and I were both cringing about being asked to uh, reveal personal feelings, uh -huh. right? I, I, it's true that I have an easier time being a scholar um, and talking about things on that level. But um, I think it's interesting that for me, the sort of my interest in God the Mother, in the feminine divine, started out as more of an exercise of really a theological exploration <clears throat> and more abstract. Uh, for me, my first religious experiences were all with Jesus Christ. I, uh, when I was in my 20s, I had a very powerful experience of uh, feeling like I had been born again, where I felt transformed. Um, I've been a person who's had a lot of depression in my life, and at a moment of total despair, um, I felt the love of, of Jesus just absolutely overwhelm me, and I gave my heart to him. And then I, so I started intellectually to look at the mother and the, and I, I loved the old ancient goddesses. I teach mythology in Greek and Latin. And really what I had to finally come to when I realized that I couldn't connect emotionally, that I connected with Jesus, but I had a harder time connecting with the mother God, I realized that it was a problem of my relationship with my own mother. And that, um, My mother had a lot of depression. She was actually a very spiritual and very wonderful woman. A lot to be admired. Um, but she she kind of, I felt in a way that I'd been abandoned by my mother. And I think what in the whole process of theologically, intellectually going through the, the, the exercise of discovering the mother, I realized that I felt I had been abandoned by the Heavenly Mother too, that she had abandoned me. And so for me, um, you know, it, it did become, there was a moment, and I guess this is the embodiment again, right? The moment where the lived experience of my struggles to like the mother, to claim the mother, um, I had to I had to embody that so it was not simply you know the intellectual exercise but that it was a, the lived religious experience so see you made me cry Maxie I tend to do that thank you Margaret for sharing yourself and also for your journey and for hanging in there and continuing to speak about the mother today we've all learned a lot from you over the years. I remember when Margaret and I shared a hallway at BYU in 1983, and uh, I would sneak in and listen to her lectures while I was editing manuscripts for the College of Humanities, and that's kind of where our relationship began. And I'm grateful she's still here. Okay, we're going to turn it to questions from you now. And I guess we've got, so hold your hand up if you've got a question. overwhelmed you all. <laughs> um, mine could be a question for anyone in this room as much as any of our panelists, but I would love to know what 
actual like daily practices that people do to um, reach out to the mother or like make space in their spiritual practice for her. I just love to hear any any thoughts on it. Uh, so again, my heavenly mother looks a little bit different than the Mormon heavenly mother, but um, in Roman Catholicism, we have Mary, and she's considered to be the mother of God, the mother of all living, and the queen of heaven, um, and the new Eve, so she's kind of a big deal um, in <laughs> Roman Catholicism. Um, but you know, I have a really complicated relationship with my faith, as probably a lot of people do. Um, my faith exists in relationship with my doubt more than anything else. Um, but we have a rosary, and that is um, prayers to Mary um, or for intercession. And so um, that's something that I've, that's a practice that I've become more interested in as I've got older. Um, and the rosary, it's, it takes a minute to learn how to pray a full rosary. Um, but it is a, from my understanding, I don't speak for all Roman Catholics, of course, um, but from my perspective, the rosary is a um, prayerful tradition that's open to anyone that is not just Catholic. And so if for anyone who's interested in a devotion to the mother, I would encourage to look into the history and the practice of praying the rosary. I, I must admit, coming from my Baptist tradition, Heavenly Mother always seemed a little... I, I just, I wasn't there. Uh, it, it was, it made it sound like we were turning God into something out of Greek mythology. And so this whole session has just been wonderful for me in kind of helping me to step outside some of those notions and open up my mind. So, but, so this practice I had not used particularly with Heavenly Mother, but I, I use, and particularly after I can no longer go to the temple. Um, I have always found that hospital chapels seem to be a place where the spirit of God is just so strong. It is probably because people go there to pray when they uh, have received bad health news themselves or they go to pray for their loved ones. Uh, there's a hospital very close to my office, and when I need to do so, I just drive up there and I go into the hospital chapel, and I, I kneel down and I have a prayer, and it has been a very spiritually uplifting, rewarding, it's kind of a recharging of the batteries almost kind of way for it to work for me, and I would think that would work with the Heavenly Mother as well. Let's go ahead and turn it back to you. Oh. Um, I had a question for Miss Roberts. Um, I really enjoyed everything you had to share with us. Uh, and you came to the conclusion that things like polygamy or the temple ban were mistakes, that they were man-made mistakes. Um, but they were, they were still supposedly revelation from a prophet. And so I just wanted to I don't know, hear what you had to say about the limits on the direction that prophets from God actually have. Yeah. <laughs> now, again, recognizing that I come from, my, uh, from a Baptist tradition, in the Baptist faith, you, it is very strongly believed and very strongly taught that each person has the right to read and interpret the scriptures. So the whole notion of having someone kind of at the head of the church that re receives revelation and shares that uh, is, is, is something that I had to grapple with. But in my grappling with it, what I very quickly understood and, you know, what my missionary said is that they're not infallible. And, and that we're, but even though my missionary said we don't believe that they're infallible, I found that many of my fellow Mormons <laughs> act as if they're infallible. And it, it seems to me, and it's always seemed very frustrating to me, that it seems that many Mormons would prefer to have an imperfect God a God that makes mistakes, a God that 
would, would exclude a certain group of people, a God that would do these things rather than to say, nah, that, that was the prophet. He, he'd gone off the deep end on that one. So, I mean, <laughs> so, so, so for me, I guess, again, just coming from that background, I, I, never, I never put the prophet up on that sort of pedestal. I, I certainly think they are inspired by God, called by God, but they are still men. They are still human. And when women get to be ordained, we are still going to be women. We're still going to be human. We will still make mistakes. So that, that, that's how I deal with it. Uh, just a quick response, too. It's funny. I was raised in the church. I'm sixth generation Mormon on all sides. But for some reason, I never... Uh, really could accept that idea of obeying the prophet no matter what. So I, I should have known at a young age I had trouble ahead, right, when that never set right with me. <laughs> Hi, good to see you again. My name is Ron Bartholomew, and I teach, I'm a religious educator for the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, and I teach Christian history and church history, and it's been my belief and kind of code that if you're going to represent anyone from any faith, you need to get the word from them. So I have so many sisters come to me and ask me questions about uh, your movement and also your, your work. I don't want to, I want to get the answer straight from you so that as they ask me questions, I can represent you the way you'd like to be represented. The, the two questions that they asked me that I really don't know the answer to, and I appreciate this young man's. First of all, I'm embarrassed that I'm a man. I apologize. <laughs> I was born one. Um, I, I don't know what to do about that. I asked this gentleman if it was okay for me to ask a question, being a man, and he said it was. I hope it's okay. I'm, I'm sincere in my question. My, my, my question is simply this. Is the Latter-day Saint, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints is an institution, is it in a state of apostasy? And if so, is the priesthood that it holds still relevant? Or would the priesthood need to be restored some other way? You know, that word apostasy is such an ugly, mean word for me. I was actually watching Planet of the Apes, and Dr. Zayas, the scientist in there, the, he calls Zira and the other one who's helping Charlton Heston, he calls them apostates. <laughs> and he says it with such anger and such almost revulsion uh, dripping from, from his tongue. So I really don't like that word. I'm aware of the fact that the Protestants first used it against the Catholics and now other people use it against them. So I don't like the word either. But I heard so many of, I heard that word come up in the conversation a couple of times, so I thought it was a fair word. Right, but, but, but I guess what my answer is, I would not, I would not even pretend or step out to say that the, the church is in a state of apostasy. I think the church has made some mistakes over the years. I think that, um, as someone said yesterday, one of the things that the church could learn how to do, the institutional church, is to acknowledge that it has made mistakes and to apologize for those mistakes. I think that would be a big lesson in the beauty of repentance for, for church members. Um, I think certainly one of, one of the things that I've, I've said in, in the context of ordained women, and one reason why I became involved, I did not want once women became in, ordained, for it to be an all-white women mm -hmm. priesthood, that 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 would not be my, you know, my idea of a good end, and so I do think that there are things that need to be done within the church to make the church more inclusive and reflective of all the members and. Whether we need to throw everything out, I don't think so. I think there are many beautiful and precious things in the church. But I think we all need to be honest and open and recognize that there are a lot of ugly things. We need to say we're sorry for the ugly things. We need to turn away from the ugly things. And we need to move forward. Thank, thank you so much. 
Uh, so I wanted to um, touch on that for a minute. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work with a lot of Mormons that a lot of people have never met. Um, there are 487 branches of the Restoration. The LDS Church is just one of them. Um, and so I've had the good fortune to get to hang out with a lot of prophets, not the LDS one, um, and a lot of prophets who think that the LDS Church is in a state of apostasy that began with John Taylor and continued, and then the final authority ended with um, Heber J. Grant. So I've had the good fortune to hang out with fundamentalist Mormons who do think that. Um, and interestingly, um, I was able to spend time with a group that lives in Nevada. They're still practicing polygamy, living law of consecration, believe that Adam is God, et cetera. And I got to spend a lot of time with them. And I remember at a Relief Society meeting, I got to go to general conference with them. And at Relief Society, uh, this woman spoke and she gave this beautiful story and she preached incredibly and she gave a testimony. And I remember I went up to one of their apostles after and I said, that was incredible. What is happening? And he looked at me as if I didn't know what I was talking about. And he said, of course, she has the priesthood. And I paused. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? And he said, well, she has the priesthood. She had her second anointing. And so for a lot of Mormons that are still doing the second anointing, that is an avenue for the priesthood. And when I further questioned it, um, I was told that that is part of the restoration. And the restoration is ongoing. And women being ordained to the priesthood is part of the restoration. Um, so I had mentioned this question to Brenda during the break, but I really like to open it to all of you. Um, so I've been really touched by just the speaking and like acting boldly um, and, you know, following your divine guidance, but really doing what you feel is right and what you're guided to do. But I was telling Brenda, I feel like there's so much difference, though, as far as like local leadership, um, where I've seen differences in several different bishops that I've had and stake presidents in just different ways that they navigate things or even kind of teach um, certain types of doctrine when it, I feel like, I understand I guess there needs to be that a space for you know revelation for each particular stake, but as sometimes I think there are things that are wrong and that need to be addressed and need to be fixed because I think it creates a mentality that's so not really true to the gospel. And so how would you navigate situations like that when you feel certain things by local leaders are different from the gospel itself, the doctrine, or just um, the first presidency leadership as well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. Um, it can be very difficult, I'll just be honest with you, because if you if it's your bishop and you go to your stake president, in many times, sometimes your stake president will simply send you back to your bishop. But um, you, you do have to go up the chain. We do have on the ordained women website um, a set of tools that people can use when they're interacting with their local leaders. Um, some of the things, I, I know Georgia is a state where if one person gives permission, if one person wants to tape record the conversation, it, you don't have to have the other person's permission. So in Georgia, we always counsel people to take a tape recorder in with you because you, you, you can be very, very upset about what's happening and you want to know what happened. Now that is not an option in states where the laws are different, but um, I insisted on having a uh, my daughter or someone else accompanied me in my last meeting with my last bishop. Um, I had had a meeting with him before, and he was, in this next meeting, he was saying he needed to have a priesthood leader present in case there were any questions about what was said. And I, I said, I absolutely refuse to come to a meeting where it's going to be two priesthood leaders and just me. Um, I had wanted to take my daughter to another meeting and that request had been refused because she was, she's not Mormon and apparently would not understand the deep thoughts that we were having there. But at that final meeting, she went. So I think uh, just insisting uh, that someone be in the meeting with you, recognizing that you don't have to go to a meeting if, if you're summoned to a meeting now. Uh, certainly your local leader can decide that that's another basis for whatever discipline that they may be considering, but they can't make you go to the meeting. You do have the option to say, I'm simply not going to attend that meeting. 
Um, sometimes there are different members within your stake presidency with whom you can cultivate a relationship. Sometimes you can reach out to, your pa to the patriarch. Sometimes you can even, if you have a relationship with someone higher in the hierarchy, reach out to them. It, it, I don't think there's one set answer for how to do it because each one of us is in a different circumstance. For me, I felt very strongly that the orders to do discipline against me came from top down. So it wouldn't have done me any good to go back up because it was coming from top down. But I'll be, I'll be happy to, if you want, if you give me your email afterwards to send you a copy of those things that we have on the ordained women's site. So I saw two aspects to your question. One that Brenda's answered, which had to do with when there's some kind of a conflict. And I want to come back to that. But first, I want to address the larger question, which is that we've all had the experience that the atmosphere of a ward or the way things, the way you experience things is really influenced by the local leaders. And that you might have a wonderful bishop who uh, is encouraging the best things that, that you would love to see happen in the church. And I, I, there are a lot of really wonderful bishops. And um, on the other hand, you may get a very authoritarian, narrow-minded bishop. And I see that that sort of tension, on one level it feels really unfortunate. You think, I wish I could just move, right, and get out of this ward. But I think it can be part of a spiritual journey where you struggle with uh, your individual faith versus the community and the people that you're, that you're interacting with. And from my own experience, there's a lot of personal growth that comes through that. And I have found that no matter where you're at, even if it seems very difficult, that there are, there's good that you can do in helping other people and also ways that you grow as you're trying to understand to be charitable to another uh, human being. But then I wanted to also go to the other aspect, which is that um, I was threatened with excommunication in 1993 as part of the September 6, but um, the local bishop refused to hold a court on me. And at the same time, our state president excommunicated my husband, but I actually had an ultimatum and a letter first. Interestingly, because, and there's lots of proof that Elder Boyd Packer personally orchestrated both my excommunication and my husband's, so that even though there was a waiting time, seven years later I was tracked down and, um, in fact, there, uh, there was another bishop that refused to hold a court on me. And according to church rules, it's supposed to be a bishop. But finally, they found a state president. So I was excommunicated by 16 men. And um, I decided to go to, the, to the, um, the disciplinary council because I felt that I wanted to have them face me. I didn't want, and I went alone. Um, my daughters had been through some really painful things in 93 when um, the September 6th happened. So I went quietly by myself. I didn't even want my, well, they wouldn't have let my husband go. But so I was there with the 16 men, and I'm glad that I went. It was very painful, I have to say, more than I thought it would be. But um, it, it did happen, you know, seven years later. So it's, it's interesting. And again, I see this all as part of a, a journey. At one point, I didn't know if I would stay involved in Mormon studies, but I, um, I really love the history and the people and the theology, and um, I'm, I'm not giving up, even though I'm, I don't intend to go back to the church. Well, they don't want me either, but. I'm not a member of the church, so I don't know what it's like to have to deal with local leadership. But um, and I would never, you know, I, I know dissent is hard, and I know that speaking out against leadership is hard, no matter what faith tradition people are in. Um, but one of the most important things I've learned from my Mormon sisters, that especially from women who participate in ordained women, that I applied to my own life is the Mormon axiom that you should do what is right and let the consequences follow, and that axiom doesn't have a caveat. <laughs> Take one last question. We do have a full hour for lunch, so we'll sneak one more question in. Anybody have a burning 
Uh -huh. <laughs> so I, I just had to ask, though, with, thank you. With regard to the question about the priesthood um, and apologies, I have two questions actually with regard to that. One, while the church essay is not a, an apology, um, I guess I'd sort of consider it a pretty bold faced admission of error, at least on Brigham Young's part. And some could say that maybe that error continued up until Kimball's time. Um, so I, I'd like to know just uh, how you feel about that. But then secondly, with regard to apology, and I, I am aware of um, um, Elder Oaks's comment about we don't apologize. Um, I, uh, what is your take on that? My take recently, just very recently, has been, is there le any legal implication to that? So if one apologizes for the church as a whole, is that then, um, do you set yourself open for issues of reparation or something like that? So while you're I rejoiced when the essay was published, but then I fully expected that just like the church, when the decision on gay marriage came out, the church leaders issued a letter that was to be read in the pulpit they, that at a minimum, that very same thing should have been done with the essays because too many of our fellow Mormons either don't know that they exist at all or if you mention them, they are convinced that it's some non-sanctioned church website that has put it up. So it was like it was issued, but, but kind of like you do a press release late on a Friday evening before a big ball game and you hope nobody will notice it. Th that is how it felt that it was done to me. And it simply did not go far enough. It's still, when you read it carefully, it is still putting the blame on God and not fully placing the blame on, on the prophets who participated in the wrong. Um, in terms of whether or not I think Elder Oaks has a legal basis for not wanting to apologize, I'm kind of going to say what Christine said, that, <laughs> you know, maybe what we need to do in the church is follow that maxim, do what is right and let the consequences follow. I think we as black people in the church are owed an apology. We, we were, many, many of us, many people did not join the church because of uh, the pre-1978 position. Many people who joined after 1978 but who were not taught about what had been the pre-1978 position, when they came up against that, that was so shattering to their testimony that they left the church. I mean, the, the, the ramifications and the harm that flowed from that is so deep and so wide that an apology is owed. 